This is a production of Cornell University. Uh, yeah, no, so it's a pleasure to be here. I was going to talk about some of the stuff that I've uh, done here over the years. Uh, I gave my PhD final talk in this very room. This chair's faced the other direction back then, but otherwise, <laughs> place. Uh, so, so this is this is familiar territory for me. Uh, so uh, not a lot of data slides today, just so you know what's coming. Um, so people come from plants, or two plant science from a lot of different places. And I started early. So this is uh, me and my mom, and that uh, is the uh, local botanic garden where we spent a lot of time. It was Carl Linnaeus Botanic Garden. He founded it, it was his teaching garden and his research garden. So it has a long history in botany. So a lot of rooting in botany. So but wait, is that you? It's your mom, but you didn't see that. That is you. Yes, so you can picture them. They can't see behind you. Uh -huh. Oh, those? Oh. And, uh, yeah, so there's mom. So where's dad at this time? Well, dad is in the lab, of course. Where else would he be? Um, so this is him as a graduate student, and he's measuring photosynthesis, studying uh, ecotypes. And at that time, you couldn't buy photosynthesis equipment. You had to design and build it yourself. You couldn't buy growth chambers. You had to design and build them yourself. You could, you could buy mechanical chart recorders, I think. Um, so all of this is stuff he engineered as a graduate student. Um, and so I lived in that research environment from early on because he was a graduate student and spending his time in the lab. And um, so 18 years after that picture was taken, he was elected to the National Academy of Sciences. So you can imagine that I was exposed to some really good science and some really good scientists, even before I left high school. Uh, and so that's the environment of botany that I grew up in. Uh, you know, Dad had that approach that, you know, if the thing he wanted to measure, you could already buy the instruments to measure it, wasn't very interesting. <laughs> so it's a different level. So anyway. We jumped to Cornell University. So I showed up at Cornell University for a few reasons as a graduate student. Um, so I wanted to uh, have a better shot at getting a job back on the West Coast where I grew up. Everybody getting applying for jobs there was already from California. So I wanted to stand out. So coming from another place was going to be helpful. You know how that turned out. So it's a foreshadowing some other twists here. Uh, and the other one was to study plant physiology. So that's what I really wanted to do. And Cornell's field of graduate field of botany had a concentration in plant physiology, and that had 80 faculty members, eight zero faculty members in just that concentration. Fantastic. And uh, and that was great. That was that was a very good situation. So, uh, but I after I finished, of course, plant physiology was no longer trending. It was called plant or biology. So it ended up being a little bit uh, hard to find work as an old fashioned plant physiologist since I was starting my career. Um, and another part was doing basic science. That was all the work I had done. So my PhD work was on gravitropism, figuring out how the little heavy particles in the columella there in the top part of that. They drop to the bottom of the cell, but then so what? How does that result in curvature of the root? There's a lot of steps involved in between there, some of which we have since discovered, but we uh, ended up uh, identifying a lot of pathways of electrical currents passing through the roots and calcium channels and calcium movement, both within cells and between cells. Uh, a lot of work's been done on figuring out that the receptor and what's going on, but we're still a little mystified about what's going on inside those cells. But that was my background. And so when I came to interview for the job here, um, that corn root, which is sweet corn, by the way, uh, showed that I really did work on vegetables. I didn't let them get bigger than that, but I, I did have work in research on vegetables, so they should hire me. And that argument and perhaps some others uh, was sufficient to get a job here. Um, <laughs> 
And so I'm going to talk about some some people and projects that I had um, through the course of the year. So when I started, um, I had an early graduate student uh, named Lauren Gardner. Uh, we wanted to come up with a good master's project. And one of the things that had happened was that the growth regulator, D9, I was no longer allowed to be used on food crops. You could use it on ornamentals, but not on food crops. And that is to maintain uh, the shorter stature so they don't stretch. When you grow them at these high populations that you see Lauren working on there, um, they tend to stretch. So in the, the one that says zero, um, that one is the skinny stretched one, and then the treated ones are shorter and stouter the way we want them, the way they would have grown had they been a little bit further apart. Uh, so pigmotropism was something that we uh, were familiar with. And so it was a matter of, can we make this technique work for uh, keeping the plants shorter? Uh, and so shortness was the quality trait we're after. And I couldn't have chosen a better graduate student. Uh, and so the goal was to have shorter plants, but not smaller plants than they would have been. Uh, and so Lauren worked out, um, you know, what's the daily growth increment normal? What's the additional growth increment that you get with this that's caused by the stretching? Um, what kind of intensity of the treatment is the plant sensing? What kind of frequency is there? Um, there's a refractory time. So when you, when you stimulate a plant, it, it says, ah, you did something to me. But then there's a period of time that it ignores further stimuli. And so you don't, treating during that period doesn't help. So you want to wait for that period to expire and then you treat again after that. Um, how long does, the, does it remember? So it turns out the plants grow at night. They figure out how much they were treated over the course of the whole day. Remember, they sum up over the course of the day and then it's expressed in the same night. So we um, were able to come up with recommendations for exactly how much to treat so that you don't do more than is necessary, but you get the maximum amount and then you do it during the right part, right size of transplants when they're sensitive. We did field trials to demonstrate that this didn't set the plants back in any way. Um, and then she went on to do more work in figuring out other species that it works on. So like you can't do peppers because they get damaged. You can do cucumbers, but only for about two days when the hypothalamus is elongating. So uh, you got a lot out of that master's thesis. Uh, it's not widely adopted because there's some other things that turn out to work well and that are easier to do. Uh, but Lauren had gone on to be a professor at Cal Poly and she served as chair of that department a few times in horticulture. And we've got a very big active horticulture program there. So she turned out good. That was a nice start for me <laughs> after graduate school. Uh, so another thing I got into early uh, here was uh, working with buckwheat as a crop. And totally by chance that this happened, that the, the, uh, the buckwheat mill for the Eastern United States, Simpenyan, and they'd been trying to get somebody to do something. Um, and uh, it, it's not a prestige crop, let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> and it doesn't behave like a field crop. So the agronomists, um, looked down on it and didn't feel it was worth any of their time. So the mill was having no luck with the agronomists at Cornell. Uh, and it's not really a horticultural crop. We tried to sell it, you know, it's in a keen, those little fruits that are keens, just like strawberries. But horticulturists are smarter than that, so that didn't really apply. But uh, I ended up working on it anyway. And some of the faculty on my mentor committee um, thought I was being really stupid. Um, but I got money and I discovered early on that having money for your research program really moves things along. So uh, that was a selling point. But because nobody else was working on this, I had it all to myself. And so I could figure out how to do extension without doing a whole lot of damage. Because nobody, if I did a bad job, nobody except the buckwheat growers would care. Um, and I could become the Soba Sensei. And I did. 
<laughs> and so, uh, so there's this buckwheat research community around the world, and I'm actually somebody within that research community, and nobody at Cornell cares. But it's, <laughs> but it's you know it, it's been fun. I gotta say it's pretty special. But it's it's actually starting to come back. There's interest now. So some of the things we did. So it has low and variable yield. The yield, the average yield, has stayed the same from about 1890 to 19. And so why is that? Well, there's a ton of reasons. If there had been only one reason, they would fix it. There's a ton of reasons. Uh, but I was able to go through and do a systematic identification of what causes the low and variable yield here in New York. And so it's a cross-pollinated crop. So is it a pollen limitation? Is it how much it grows? Is it partitioning? Um, is it uh, high temperatures causing abortion of the flowers? So there were a whole bunch of things that we looked into systematically one by one. And uh, so this is one of my few data slides, but I've got sort of 20 bushels an acre is marked on the yield axis, vertical axis. That's where you start making money. And then the x-axis is how big the plant is, so above ground dry matter. And for a lot of crops, it's a very tight line. The harvest index is pretty much the same all the time. The plants are designed to partition to the harvested unit very, very effectively. And you, as you can tell by the scatter in this plot, that's not true for buckwheat, that it can, it can do very well, but a lot of the time it doesn't. So why is that? And another thing is that when you make the plants bigger, they don't yield more. The really big plants don't yield well because basically they're partitioning to vegetative growth rather than to uh, uh, reproductive growth. And uh, there's a lot of things that are happening. So pollination was the biggie um, that people thought that, that really you have to add bees and then you have to do a bunch of things there. So we looked at at that, and the bees do deliver pollen, but not a lot. Um, but buckwheat's kind of unusual, it turns out. So the top picture there, you see uh, some pollen grains on the stigma, and then the pollen grains are starting to grow down the stalks. What's remarkable about this is that that is five minutes after we put the pollen grains on. So they've germinated and grown about a third of the way down in five minutes. That tells you something about the pollen composition. So it's a single ovary fruit. So the first pollen grain to reach the micropyle, which is what's happening down the, the green thing in the bottom. That's the micro, that's the pollen tubes heading into the micropyle uh, in the ovary. So the first one in is sires the, that seed. And we discovered that there is such a thing as pollen competition in uh, buckwheat, which was a hot topic at that time. So if so that the fastest pollen is also the one that produces the strongest project. So that's, that's pollen competition. So having a lot of pollen grains racing at once gives you better progeny. Uh, and as you can tell, if more pollen showed up five minutes later, like the second B, it doesn't really matter. Already lost the race right from the get-go. It's only that first float that matters. And bees don't deliver a lot. So that's, I think, a pollination issue. And we also happen to find that there's sexual selection, which was also a hot topic at the time. That is to say, certain uh, pollen donors are preferred uh, by the pollen receivers. Uh, and so they will preferentially make progeny with some of the donor pollen. So um, just like him, right? Um, so we've also looked at, yeah, so high temperature plays a role, day length plays a huge role in determining whether partitioning goes to uh, seeds or to leaves. So we've got a lot of recommendations out in the buckwheat on when to plant, how to plant, um, that takes a lot of the physiology into account. Um, we also got to do extension, and so one of the first things you do in extension is find out what the grower community needs. And it turned out with buckwheat, recommendations were helpful. But what the grower 
really needed was first of all community because it was such a disrespected crop um, that they didn't know each other. In fact, they were afraid to admit to other people at the diner that they raised up. So, <laughs> and so that it is really the, the sort of community of growers that knew how to do it was dissolving. It was really uh, quite a challenge. Um, and the buyers, the companies that did the buying, they didn't have field reps out there connecting the growers. Um, and uh, Cooperative Extension didn't have anybody out there uh, for a while. So they, so community was really important. And the other thing was dignity. It's okay. You don't have to be embarrassed. Um, and uh, so I started doing these uh, annual grower field days where they would come out and we would talk a little bit about what we saw the crop doing. And then the, the most important thing, I think, is they got to talk to each other and we got to be buckwheat people together. <laughs> it was, uh, so I'd say as an introduction to uh, extension, that was really valuable. You, you start to understand how many dimensions there are to this thing. Obviously, I had no training whatsoever in doing any of these things. Um, fortunately, I have colleagues who know what they're doing. So I've been able to uh, learn that part as well. And I can say one sign of progress of this is when you drive around, you'll see well-regarded farms plant buckwheat by the road where you can tell where it is. And in the past, those were always on the other side of the hedge. So yes, I see Chris nodding. Metrics of extension success, there you go. <laughs> Um, so I want to skip on to another thing I worked on for a while that was fun. So I had a colleague, Gary Harmon. Um, so he was breeding fungi for better biocontrols. Uh, so this was sort of my mentor committee pushing me to do more horticulture and get out of that pseudo agronomic crop. And so this was an opportunity to do more horticulture things. So, um, so Gary had bred a trichoderma, that's a fungus-like thing, that is a great biocontrol. It's, it's, a, it's in every soil. Um, it's the first uh, fungus that colonizes compost. So there's a zillion strains, a, a huge community studying all kinds of aspects. Um, but they had bred one that colonizes roots very, very effectively in the lab. And so, you can see it on that, on the emerging root, adventitious root there. Uh, and Gary is a great enthusiast. It's so much fun working with him. And so one of the characteristics of this strain was that it has greater rhizosphere competence than any other strains. And rhizosphere competence means it grows on the root. So usually if, you're, if you work on the rhizosphere microbiome at all, um, you realize pretty quickly that it's the habitat that make, that determines who's there far more than what you add. The newcomers generally don't make it. And so we tested this in field experiments. And um, so the green bars and green line are the colonization of the of roots that were inoculated. And the yellow ones are the native trichoderma flora. And what we can see is that there's a lot more when you inoculate, even when the crop is growing. So it's successfully colonizing the roots, which is remarkable. That doesn't usually happen. Um, and the bar graph there is where we looked at uh, different soil environments developed in a 17 year at that time study at Rodale, um, where they've been using different nutrient sources and really establishing very distinctive uh, uh, microbial environments, particularly the legume one. And this is, uh, it was able to uh, establish on roots in all of those. So the native flora, it outcompeted the native flora all the time. So that was a, really a, a first for being able to do that much. Uh, then we got in a graduate student, Batama Mastoria doctoral student. So because Gary had a company, he wasn't allowed to be an injury advisor for a graduate student because there's the potential to exploit graduate students. So it's a serious concern. Um, and so I was Fatima's major advisor. And so 
she came straight from Iran and started meeting with Gary and me. And uh, I'd say about the second or third year, we'd have these great meetings to talk about research plans. And Gary would say, oh, you got to do this, you got to do that. And then I would say, oh, I don't know. I think it would be better if you did this, better if you did that. And, and that's where we left it. So Fatima was in this situation of if you were going to do something just to please your major advisor, it wasn't in the cards. That was not a possibility. So she had to figure out for herself which of our wise words were worth uh, following up on. And she did an awesome job of that. And so what she uh, did was really identify that a lot of the um, oxidative damage that happens when a seed germinates, when it imbibes water, the membranes start to reform and all the biochemistry starts up. There's a lot of oxidative damage there. And especially in a weak seed that can really debilitate the seed. And so she found that when you start adding water, the trichoderma germinates at about 17 hours that, um, Biochemistry starts happening in the seed in about 35 hours, and the radical comes out at around 55 hours. And she could cut several hours off the radical emergence time with the trichoderma. So that's really incredible. Um, and then it has other consequences later on um, as the seedling grows. And so this was pretty good uh, discovery of how to um, how the trichoderma, this particular strain of trichoderma, I should say was actually working uh, to enhance plant growth. And um, it's now a commercial product. Um, there's a whole company built around that product. And there's a second company built around um, some of the successor strains. Um, and uh, so the, cup, I mean, the recommendations that came out of that are pretty simple. One, of course, you have to apply to dry seeds. Sprinkling trichoderma spores or inoculum around after the seed is germinated, it doesn't really help. It has to be there right at germination to make a difference. And that's super important. If you think about how people use uh, microbial inoculants, um, it, it's all over the place. And this one is very specific. And the other one is to expect more large plants, but not larger plants necessarily, that it's the somewhat weakened ones that are brought up to 100% or 110, something like that. Um, the, the dead ones remain dead. So we, we were hoping for a resurrection uh, material that didn't get it. Uh, but that, um, those are, are very helpful for making the product successful. And when you have something like that, all these biostimulants and microbial inoculants and stuff, there is a lot of snake oil out there. And you see bigger plants, some of the time with all of them. But which ones are bogus? Which ones could do something, but you're not applying them right? Um, it's, very, it's a very tough environment. And, this, and if you just put this one on and measure arbitrarily, you would probably see the same thing. But if you use it right, it really does what it's supposed to do. Um, so then I'm going to swing over to cover crops. So this was. Um, coming into extension. So I was originally hired as 100% research, um, but they wouldn't let us do that after a while. So <laughs> I had to have a split appointment. So I took on extension as an official role. I'd had, I have to say Hugh Price was my initial chair. He was fantastic with um, making sure everybody knew how to do extension. If you're at Geneva, you gotta know how to do extension. That was not optional, whatever your appointment was. Um, but I had, Gotten to know Carol McNeil was uh, uh, with Cornell Cooperative Extension in Ontario County, so I know her pretty well. And she had gotten in with this soil health team that was starting up and doing exciting things. Uh, and so I, I worked with her to figure out what are the real grower needs. She really say for all vegetable crops, what are the top grower needs that I might be able to do something about? And she was saying, everybody's asking me about cover crops, but I don't have anything good to tell them. And, you know, the literature's about California and Florida, and who knows whether that's relevant to us at all. So it's really a void of information. So not necessarily a research void, but that was a huge information need. And um, tying that in with soil health was real easy because soil health 
gives you two prescriptions. One, reduce tillage. The other, plant cover crops. All right, so you get the prescription, plant cover crops. What do you plant? Uh, we needed answers. So great situation there. Um, so I dug into that. And I have to mention, Joe Shale came my way about that time. He had been a, a technician with uh, Rosie Providenti and uh, um, with Dick Robinson, who was a vegetable breeder. So Joe is a virologist, uh, pathologist, uh, could produce seeds like nobody's business. Amazing, amazing skills. But I have to say, his number one skill was teaching me how to be level-headed. So when everything was falling apart, I said, let's just do one step at a time and it'll be done when we're finished. And so it was. So I, I have to give him huge credit. Um, you can see him standing in a field here. You want to know what happens if you plant broccoli on the muck? This is what happens when you plant broccoli. <laughs> Talk about having things go too vegetative. Nit nitrogen doesn't mix. We didn't try that. Um, uh, so this is, um, so one of the first things I looked at for cover crops was, was buckwheat because I knew it and it's a great cover crop for weed control. Weed control is usually the number one issue for growers. Um, so one of the questions is when do you plant it? And so we did a whole mess of sequential plantings. Every year is different, but it's basically how big did the plants grow at different planting dates. And we found that June and July were good, and May and August were unreliable because it's either too cold at the front or too cold at the back. Um, so we had a lot more details of that, but a lot of experiments along those lines for developing um, planting windows um, and coming up with an algorithm to help figure out all the um, characteristics of the time so we could actually um, develop a map like this at the last reasonable planting date for any particular location. This is now in an online tool that growers use that they can put their particular farm in and get a lot more detailed data. Um, but coming up with planting windows like this, one thing that this map shows that comes true for a bunch of other things, if you look over in like Iowa and the Dakotas, you can see that the colored lines run pretty much straight across. But then you come up to New York and you can't use latitude or longitude or anything uh, to estimate what that planting date is going to be. You really do have to throw some calculations at it to get an idea um, of what's appropriate dates. Uh, the other thing was putting things in a framework that was really useful. And so we developed early on a recommendation guide based on information that was available. And um, it's centered around two questions. And I found this to be very helpful. What's the management goal? Because there are many different potential management goals. And what cover crop fits the planting opportunity best? And that, um, that second one, I, lately I've started saying, use the best player for that position. I'm thinking about it as a, a team member on the management program. Um, so that guide's been up for a long time. There are newer ones that have been part of that serve the region. So this idea has uh, developed a lot in the meantime. Um, and this is a slide I use in just about every cover crop talk because it, it uh, turns out that it's uh, growers who know how to do these things can have success with their cover crops. If they do all the things that are required to get a fast start, all of the things that are required to have no gaps in the stand and to know how to kill it on time. And that means you have to know what on time means. That can be more difficult than figuring out how to kill it once, once you know that. Uh, but that's been a nice paradigm for doing uh, the cover crop extension and, and then doing the research behind it to know what does on time mean for different contexts? What's the growth stage of the cover crop? What are you planning to do next? What did you do before? Um, what are you going to use to kill it? A whole bunch of things that need research so that you know what the answer is. And then um, finally, I'll run through the broccoli stuff. So you've probably heard of this uh, one way or another. Uh, this was one of those fun problems that came along. Mike Dixon 
uh, was a vegetable breeder. He bred a number of things, but he had broccoli and, and he showed me this funny thing that was going on. That there were these uneven flower bud sizes. And that is what broccoli looks like in the summertime here. Can't sell that obviously. Um, but it seemed like a small enough defect that it could be fixed, right? Uh, and it seems to be associated with the heat. And so I thought, well, that's, that's a pretty straightforward uh, plant development question. Well, I should dig into that just out of curiosity. We'll see where it goes. Uh, and so it turns out that it, it really is a temperature thing. Uh, it's really the cool temperature. So it's like chilling hour accumulation kind of a deal. Um, and it happens very early. So these um, inflorescences are about eight millimeters across. Usually the sensitive stage has already passed when they're this big. Um, so it's early in development. So we were able to identify that fairly early on and that provided a screening technique that if you had a lot of resources, you could make progress uh, reading for that, uh, that trait. And we ended up digging into the genetics. So this is uh, the, I did a sabbatical at UCLA and we were able to do some in situ hybridization. So this shows where the, uh, the leafy gene is being expressed in the various stages of development. Uh, we thought that was gonna be a really important gene, but as Su Chang has recently demonstrated, uh, not one of them. Not one of the most important ones. Uh, I had a grad student then, Denise Duclos. Uh, and if you went to Su Shang's talk a couple of weeks ago, this is kind of led into uh, the thread he went into. But we looked at all the, the homeotic genes that determine uh, the identity of the meristem or the organs. And so they had just worked out a number of those in Arabidopsis, and Denise was able to work out their expression patterns in broccoli. And they're all there and they all change expression, but not quite at the same time and not in the way that you would expect based on their function in Arabidopsis. Um, <clears throat> and that kind of, what do you do next when you discover that? Uh, you, you can't build based on what those genes are doing. So, we weren't able to take that further. And that's where I think the young Su Sheng managed to do was, was really impressive. Uh, so then um, another opportunity came along in 2009. The, in the Farm Bill, we got the Specialty Crops Research Initiative. The program manager for that was going around telling people about it. and. He said, what we want to see is a big complicated problem that you've identified and that you propose to do a complete solution <laughs> with a transdisciplinary team. And we'll give you big bucks to do it. And everybody says, yeah, right, I'm supposed to do that. Um, but we ended up going there. And um, yeah, so this was a write up in the New York Times a couple of years after we started it. So we, managed to get some publicity for that. Um, so my, my collaborator in deciding that we were gonna go for it uh, was Mark Farnham. So he's a broccoli breeder down in Charleston, South Carolina. And he'd been breeding the heat for heat resistance in broccoli because they have a lot of heat down there, obviously, uh, and was having some success. So he thought we can, we can breed the broccoli that will grow here. Um, but then we identified that, well, the seed companies don't care because it's not a big enough market. Nobody's buying broccoli seed in the East. And the growers weren't growing broccoli because they couldn't get decent seed. And the uh, this, uh, wholesalers wanted local, 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 but they couldn't find any anybody to buy from, so they weren't trying. So there are all these steps. And so it truly was a transdisciplinary problem to fix this. And we had to hit all of those things so, you know, the, the old chicken and the egg. You have to have all of the pieces in place before anything moves. Um, so it's really fortunate to get Jill Eccleston uh, on. She was uh, uh, 
uh, entomology PhD out of Cornell. Uh, but she worked with me for 13 years on this project. Collaborator relations, uh, keeping everybody going, analyzing the, the uh, reading progress and working on metrics there. Um, and as an entomologist, also developing current sensible insect recommendations. Uh, and then uh, Philip Griffiths, broccoli reader in, in Geneva. So he's, uh, he's a guy that's up for a challenge. I gotta say, Griffiths is a great collaborator. Just come up with an, an idea and it's, you know, can't be done, stupid idea. And then he does it. <laughs> <laughs> and then he does something else next week. Uh, that's, that's cool too that he didn't think about. It. So fun to have collaborators like that. So we got, we got him reading for heat tolerance too. Um, so this is um, about halfway through the project. This was the collaborator list. So when I say that Jill was managing collaborator relationships, it's a big job. Uh, so in, this was in genetics, reading, regional trials, nutritional quality, economics, farming, extension, and distribution in retail. So huge, huge group. Uh, so we did uh, trials of new materials for uh, reading programs. Uh, so we had uh, all but cicada, all of the reading commercial and private, uh, I'm sorry, commercial and public reading programs were involved with this trialing material, trying trialing new crosses, seeing if we could make some progress um, planting in the different potential windows when it's not too cold and it's not too warm and we could actually get a, a crop and can we extend that into that too warm period a little bit. And uh, this is one of our analysis of uh, how things perform. So each row is a different growing environment. Each column is a different uh, hybrid and Green is good and pink is bad. So, uh, so this is just for an overall quality trait. We were evaluating um, 15 different traits altogether. Um, and so you see the leftmost columns are the varieties that were available when we started the project. And you see a lot of pink there. And then the uh, middle part were the early releases. Uh, and uh, you see some more green happening there. And the varieties that are available now are towards the um, right end there, and you see a lot more green. So that gives you an idea of the breeding progress that's been made. So that's been quite successful, I would say. And there, um, so, um, and so Zach Stamsel was able to really look at the evolution of. Uh, broccoli, identify where we're getting broccoli from, uh, pathways associated with high temperature. Um, so he's able to um, map for candidate genes. Uh, so each of those is a little chart of the uh, different traits that we could find um, regions that where the genetic diversity is responsible for variation in that trait. Um, so bead uniformity, which was our big trait, um, beginning of chromosome three and the end of chromosome four, there's something really interesting there uh, to dig into. Uh, and he also saw that the, um, in comparing the elite hybrids with the land races, there are some regions uh, where there's interesting material that we can bring in uh, to the elite material. Uh, and so there are successes. That's a hybrid that's on the market this year. And there we go. So <laughs> takes us later. So the, the second picture there was taken last week. So mom and I are still going to botanic gardens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Gamble Garden in Palo Alto, uh, where they spent some of the Procter & Gamble fortune in a beautiful place in Palo Alto. So that's where she is now. Um, and uh, so that's, uh, I think, a, a 
very good uh, time I've had doing it. I keep telling people I can't imagine a better job. I got to do all kinds of things that I thought were fun, pursue interesting stuff, um, both scientifically and socially, um, that really feel like they matter. And found a lot of people that are really a lot of fun to work with and do things with. Anyway, thanks very much. What advice or like habits or suggestions you would have for early career researchers? Yeah. Well, I think right, understanding the environment that you're in so, uh, and being able to accommodate change very well. So, you know, I, I came to Cornell to study drought. And I, and I recognized quickly that it was not a good place to study drought. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, changed, I changed substantially there. So, making changes like that when the, the environment's conducive to something different than, than what you were doing. Uh, is one and having but knowing how to take all of your skills toward towards a different goal i think that's uh one of the really important things for success and then um what i found to be useful like i described here is really understand the problem well and understand the mechanisms that underlie the solutions you're working on uh, and then find very straightforward ways to boil it all down so I've got years and years of research condensed into seven words, right? In three lines on the cover crops. But that's another part that if you can get, if you can tweet the conclusion of your research project uh, to a wide audience. So those are some things that I think are, are helpful to think about. Relatively straightforward, they're not, they're not terribly advanced concepts. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, we're trained to do science and sort of yeah. focus on certain things, but I think as a career, you know, yeah. reaching out and doing things beyond, you know, feels important. You've done that. Yeah. Uh, you kind of skipped over a little bit, but could you say a little bit about your work in Washington and yeah, so how you sort of develop these professional skills outside of research? Yeah. So the work we do isn't for free, right? It costs a lot of money to do the work. I've done the math, but at least for agritech, our total spending is around a million and a half dollars per profession. It's a lot of money, year after year. That People aren't giving us that out of the goodness of their hearts. They're expecting a big return on that. And uh, so you need to make sure that keeps coming by producing. And people have many reasons um, to provide that and Congress is huge. So I started um, going to Congress and then training people to go to Congress uh, to bring in uh, money for the horticulture program. So the specialty crop research initiative was a really big one. That's become a lot of money, um, but there are other ones that are coming along that were uh, asking for money for and being able to tell stories about Look at the good things that money did. Give us a little more and we'll do even more. Um, that works really well. And I, I think that's something that we all have to be trained for. If, any, if we're getting money, we, we need to not just report back to the department chair or, <laughs> uh, or uh, to the program leader at USDA. You really have to go all the way back uh, to make sure that that keeps coming. So. So we have a question from Janine yeah. from Bruce Rice. Bruce, yeah. you wanna turn on your mic? Sure. Uh, hey, Thomas, <clears throat> great okay. seminar. Thank you. Um, I've re really been wondering what was going on next door all these years, but thanks for uh, <laughs> giving me a great summary. Um, and for those of you that haven't been to his office, it's so well organized, it's just as well organized as the seminar. It's one of the cleanest and brightest and nicest offices. I'd also like, so a comment and a question. Uh, thank you for being DGS and doing so much for the department for so many years. Um, you've just been selfless about your work, whether it's for the growers or for Cornell or the department or the section. So thank you. Um, the question I have is about the, um, the chart that you showed with uh, some possible 
uh, chromosomal locations um, affecting uh, traits in the broccoli head. Do you know if there are some groups that are following up further to get down to the gene level to develop markers for, for those traits, but especially to associate those traits with particular genes? Yeah, um, I think that this is a critical question in the, uh, in the world of marker-assisted selection or, uh, or CRISPRing. Um, and in a very general sort of an observation, something that you see Mark Sorrell's clued me into this <laughs> early on. Uh, so breeders don't use physiologists stuff very often. Uh, if you decide to figure out how to how some particular phenomenon works, usually the, the breeders have fixed it, and then you compare the current fixed varieties with the old non-fixed varieties, um, and then explain afterwards how they did what they did. So that's the normal dynamic. So I've had that in my mind uh, all along. Um, so what I saw happening in uh, broccoli is that neither Griff nor Mark were using molecular markers for the improvements. Um, that it, it's a really big numbers game. They're also selecting on dozens of traits at the same time and the interaction among dozens of traits. Uh, and that gets computationally impossible in a hurry. Um, but your brain can do that um, by looking at it. So they were uh, generally using that technique. Um, we're seeing that uh, seed companies are, are, are using marker-assisted selection for a very limited number of traits that they need to get rid of early, early in the process. Um, and so they, they are very much set up for high throughput uh, genotyping for a, a small number of things, but they, they genotype everything. Um, so my guess is that in, um, in broccoli breeding, it's probably going to be more genomic selection than single gene stuff, just because the traits and the interactions are so complicated that you have to select for everything at the same time, and that the individual, the single gene things will not be that important. Um, but knowing which, um, where there's interesting variation helps you develop the, the tools for genomic selection. So that, that's my guess of where things are likely to be moving fast based on what I've just been seeing lately. It's good time for maybe one more. I'm gonna fuck with casting for you. <laughs> <laughs> if it was such, I mean, I love, I use Parpito, it doesn't matter. I love Soba and I use it as a cover crop, but if it was such a bad crop and it was such a, why were they growing it in the first place? Yeah, why were they growing it in the first place? Well, it's, uh, uh, it grows well where you have uh, low fertility, particularly low nitrogen, and that was pretty much the condition. So um, it was one of the major crops in, in this area. Um, in the 1850s, it was probably the most common crop in the southern tier in northern Pennsylvania. Um, and it remains very important in Eastern Europe as the last resort peasant rural food source. Um, but so these that part of the world has run reason. into last resort on a regular basis, but it stays there. Uh, but it's very, uh, it's driven now, in part, it has interesting flavor, so that drives it, but also because it's gluten-free, you can get kind of that rich flavor in a gluten-free grain. That's what's driving it right now. So Bruce uh, commented on that. Um, it was commonly used by Eastern European immigrants to the US. Yeah. 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 yeah okay. no, Kasha market in New York City was um, it was fading in the early 90s because the first generation immigrants were dying off. They were, they were the ones that were really sticking to it. Fantastic. Well, thank right. you so very yes. much. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.